Three scary skeletons and shivers down your spine. Shrieking skulls will shock your soul, seal your doom tonight. Spooky scary skeletons speak with such a screech. You'll shake and shudder in surprise when you hear these zombies shriek. I smoke poke every day. Every day. <laughs> then when it comes in, it's just like, eat my bullet. And the boy's just like, oh no. I'll eat five. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really terrible, actually. Yeah, we gotta cut that part out. I probably, I probably won't. I'll probably keep it. You don't, but I'll, but I'll cut what name we're talking about. I hope. Yeah, like, no, I'll cut that part. We're gonna anger a whole group of fucking people in a second. Day. Race riots, <laughs> race riots, essentially. Hey, yo, world star, world star hip hop, here it comes. <laughs> That's my demographic. <laughs> you just post it on World Star's website. <laughs> They're like, oh wow, this guy's got really good creepy pastas right now. <laughs> Let's look at him on this shit. <laughs> it's just a bunch of dudes in a room swirling wine with monocles. Mm. Mm, indeed. This is a great time for a show. Sir, can I... What? For us. <laughs> what? <laughs> I did something similar to Franz McBoohoo last night, and he got really fucking mad. What the fuck did you do? I was in the middle of the story, and then it was someone, someone yelled, and I just held on to the yell for like a minute. <laughs> and he just got really fucked. I think he got up. I think he like got a- he got up and left the couch. He said something along the lines of "I'm going to take a piss," and then like stalked toward <laughs> and then stalked towards my fucking bathroom. And I continued reading my story like without him here. I like acknowledged it and everything. Um, okay, so <laughs> this is <laughs> this is lots of pasta. I like that we're in the fucking middle of this out of nowhere. <laughs> Mm. I thought this was going to be our test. The I believe, next thing I know. No, I believe that every episode tends to get the introduction of the episode later and later because we just naturally jump into a conversation. Makes sense. Obviously, Django Phillips' name didn't happen until like the fourth minute. So, Oh, Django Phillips, man. Django Phillips, I good guy. This is lots of pasta. This is the, uh, this is the podcast where we read creepypastas and that's because um they're a magical gift to bring into the world it, the world is starving the world the world is in need of hunger what is it they it's say about the af wait, wait, hold the, phone. <laughs> the world is in need of hunger they in, like, in the like, need of like, i think that man i really want to be hungry right now so <laughs> so yeah the dying. world the world is is in hunger Hungary. <laughs> no, not the country. They're Hungarian. <laughs> I am of Hungarian descent, believe it or not. Oh, yeah. That's my dad's yeah. side. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> we need to feed the people all our pasta. What if they are, they have a gluten issue? They, <laughs> they grow it on they just, farm. Yeah, just, just like wild <laughs> spaghetti monsters moving around. They're just feeding them. They take them out like cows. <laughs> you should write creepypasta. Right? <laughs> like I'm set here, here. I'm gonna hit the world with my first creepypasta. Here we go. <clears throat> I woke up in a dark room. My nightlight was out. What happened? Oh shit! Never gonna be able to go to bed without a nightlight anymore. I'm just gonna say that now. Do you have do you have a name that that we could attribute this story to? There's going to be like four names at this point. God damn it, you gotta stick to... Uh, I mean, I guess I can't tell you to stick to one. I just, I would appreciate um, at least a trail of All right. thought. Uh, so, uh, here's the day that I reveal myself with this name. It was going to be Jack Reach Around, because we're talking about Jack Reacher. But uh, it's going to be Terry Tickler. Terry Tickler. Terry the Tickler. Kind of like Jeff the Killer. Creepypasta right there. Terry the Tickler. Terry the Tickler. I don't actually have Jeff the Killer. I don't want to read it. I'm, it's terrible. The face it's, freaks me out. So no, it has nothing. his backstory. It has nothing to do with his face. It's the story's shit. Have you actually ever no. even too afraid to read it? Kind of. That's I hate what, his I mean, face. I, mean, I hate the, the face they the have photo, for him. The photoshopped eyes and the, the blank like Microsoft Paint face. Yeah. It's too much. Yeah, I hate it. 
I can imagine. In the I mean, I don't like the um, I don't like the drowned Zelda kid. So I oh, guess yeah. I guess I could okay. understand that. Yeah, that was a weird one. I do not like. I that. D- I loved watching those glitches though. Those homemade glitches. That was one of the first creepypasta things I got into, and I was like, "Look at this video game. It's glitch." And then I was like, "Oh wait, this guy is like making it do that on yeah. purpose. He's made making a scary story out of this game." Really, really awesome mixed media. It's kind of like the Pokemon ones, too. I love Where the it's Pokemon the Pokemon ones. green, and it's like, oh, no, she comes to the top of the mountain. There's Ash killing her Pokemon and drinking her blood or something. Yeah. And there's Professor Oak that's, uh, we won't go into the word, but he touches her without her consent. <laughs> it's like this how that's yeah that's how every average like five out of ten pokemon creepypastas end in all honesty they really do it's professor oak being a creep or wearing someone's skin i had a professor oak last year like it like a like my teacher's name was actually professor oak she was a four foot tall asian woman spoke perfect english oh very nice <laughs> Yeah, so this is lots of pasta, and uh, and uh, this is this is Terry the Tickler. Okay, so I'm gonna let I'm gonna let you start. This is a campfire story. Wow! By Judd Apatow. <laughs> <laughs> or it's not heavyweights. <laughs> or Judd a potato. God damn it. <clears throat> All right, here we go. We're gonna get the we're gonna get the creepy voice on. For a number of years, though. <laughs> I was gonna say I don't think that, that was gonna pick up very well. Yeah, uh, no, here, can you give me the mic. I'm gonna get this one. I don't like that. For a number of years, I was a camp counselor at an overnight. Does he have a disease? <laughs> okay, <clears throat> I got the voice. For a number of years, I was. Camp counselor at overnight camp in Muskoka. I love it more than any job I've ever had. Despite the non-existent pay, annoying campers, long day and short nights, crappy food, etc. For one, I got to tell as many scary stories as I could sputter out. There was nothing better than hanging around a dying campfire with a bunch of junior high kids who were demanding the scariest, most blood-curdling tale I knew. He does not know love. <clears throat> <laughs> this is this is the most enjoyable thing in his life. <laughs> yeah, seriously, this poor guy. Like, go on, watch a TV watch show. In forest with little kids. This one time I was in forest, I was very happy. <laughs> Let me tell you, my family for Christmas they get me forest pajamas. You know how happy I was? I was happy, so happy that I had happy feet. I love that movie. <laughs> And that's how all of these horror stories at this campfire go. Yeah, it's like, oh, little boy in a room, dead, dead on the floor. He hold knife that killed dad, and he's just like, let's go watch Happy Feet. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 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 your version of a skeleton popped out. Yeah, it's true. Why not? Because <laughs> it's Happy Feet. And then we watched Happy Feet. <laughs> all right. And I told them all. The babysitter in the eerie clown statue. The, hey, I know both. Yeah, I know that one. The driver and the creepy guest attendant. Uh, I actually do think I know that one. The woman and her licking dog. Is that yeah. the one you read? Licky, 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 licky. Or as Franz McBoohoo would say, ricking. I saved my best stories for overnight trips we made in Algonquin Park for non Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> the first word made me think he was gonna be like some Russian, Russian dude. Russian <laughs> Don't Canadian. worry, I got Gaga counter. So this entire time it's been like, I like hanging out in a forest with kids, eh? <laughs> Alright. I hope no mouse get us, eh? Time to change up voice. <clears throat> you, you wanna drink some of my drink? It's a uh, syrup. It's a massive park in the middle of Ontario, spanning nearly 8,000 square kilometers. Gosh. <laughs> 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 when, That's for Walt Disney got. <laughs> That's he's like those fucking Canadians. I'm gonna name them Goofy. <laughs> when days will be spent canoeing on pristine lakes and nights will be spent around the fire, singing and making s'mores and being as rowdy as the only people within miles could be. Once the kids had quieted down, I tell them the story of a stalker in the woods with a face so horrifying it paralyzed all of his victims in fear. 
or the group of campers who decide to spend the night across the lake from an abandoned or was it insane asylum? Was it? I don't even know. Exactly. <laughs> On this it? particular night, I finished up the tales once again, insisting that they were entirely true, and sent a camper to the tent. To the tent. It's just one tent. There's like 20 people in the tent. <laughs> Alright, now get ready. Here I come. <laughs> I'm all looped up. It had been an exhaustion day. None of the six kids were in any mood to stay up later. My fellow counselor had also decided to pack it in. Side of me. <laughs> Leave him just to me on a fallen log next to the dying fire. I took a deep breath of the cool, fresh Prince of Bel Air. And... <laughs> <laughs> Bud sat there and looked out at the lake. The partial moon reflected off the glassy water, and on the other side, I could see towering cliffs going up several hundred feet. I considered whether we could canoe over, climb up a few dozen feet, and some cliff jumping. I grinned. Camp director would have my head if we did that, if he found out. Movement at the very top of the cliffs caught my eye. There was a small light bobbing across the peak. At first, I thought it was a star, but it was larger and gave off a golden glow. It slowly moved back and forth in a small arc. As I sat up and watched it, another appeared next to it, bobbing along the top of the cliff. Then another and another, and a few more. My stomach dropped into my feet. I grabbed my bag and pulled my digital camera out, and focused it on the little glowing orbs and used the zoom function. I counted them, and then I counted again. Oh shit. In a flash, I was up and running to the tents. Hey guys, wake up! We gotta go! There was a movement in the tents, and I had seven confused heads looking out at me. My co-counselor wore a mixture of concern and pure anger. I'd hate to do this, I continued, but the clouds are looking really threatening. There's a big rainstorm coming in, and if we get caught in it, it's going to ruin our trip. Rain Wilson storms. You don't want to be in them. I pulled a map and flashlight on my bag. There's a ranger station a few kilometers south of us. I traced the path with my finger. Thank God we could make it there in a few hours. Campers, can't we just go in the morning? No! I shouted, my voice echoing across the lake. I lowered it. Come on, let's get packed up and go. I'll tell you a story along the way. I smiled, though I could feel my lips quivering. That seemed to get them going. And within de Seriously? <laughs> Let me tell you a scary story, because we're going to die in a storm. Okay, let's go! It's the, it's I'm not gonna tell you a scary story. Uh, can't we just wait? <laughs> it's the it's the distract the scared shitless people by making them shared scared shitless. Of shared shared skitless. Shared of skitless <laughs> of something else. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we'd begun our trek into the deep woods. I don't like this voice anymore. With a small flashlight, our only guide, I will find you. Kill you. Yeah, yeah, he's here with them. When I was confident we were moving at a steady pace, I allowed myself to relax and begin to tell my favorite campfire story. Centuries before the European settlers made their way into the country, it was inhabited by the First Nations people. They had made the trip from across western Canada, following the migration patterns of large animals such as buffalo and bison. Eventually, they reached Ontario, at which point they split off into smaller groups of travelers, each searching for a section of land to call their own. Legend has it that one group consisting of about 20 men, women, and children had ventured through this very area in search of a place to call home, though it wasn't even the end of October. The weather had made a turn for the worse, then the group journeyed round the lake. A fierce blizzard hit. Within an hour, the group found themselves in blinding snow and below zero temperatures. The clothes they had on them were made for the fall, not this sort of weather. And there weren't any Canada goose jackets around back then. <laughs> But they pressed on. Those nice jackets you're wearing now, they didn't have them then, you little, little fucker. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have any choice. Night was falling as they reached a cliff bluff, which towered over a cold, choppy lake. There was no stopping for this group. They'd die. That's it. That's the story. It's over. <laughs> if they didn't make it past the cliffs. But with darkness setting in and the snow falling even harder, visibility was almost non-existent. So one of the elders had an idea. Using the little kerosene they had left, he lit a lantern for each of the travelers and had them carry it in front of them. Not so that they could see the cliffs, but so they could see who was in front of them, allowing them to all follow each other across the narrow bluffs. Yeah. With the strongest of men leading the way, the group began to cross the cliffs. The freezing wet snow... Here we go, we're gonna come in with a news reporter soon. 
The freezing wet snow soaked every bone in their body. I'm going B-52s almost now. The harsh wind chilled any exposed skin and threatened to push them right off the rock. Their path was no more than a few feet wide and would have been slippery to even the best of hiking boats, let alone hand fashioned moccasins. Slowly, painstakingly slowly, they made their way up the cliffs, praying that whatever lay on the other side could shelter them from the intensifying snow. Okay, we're done with that. They were about halfway up, hundreds of feet above the lake, though it was well out of their vision. In fact, all they could see in the blinding storm was the lantern in front of them, acting as a beacon to guide their steps. The light moved up, they moved up. If it went down, they moved down. Each of the travelers was almost entranced, caring about nothing but the glowing orb a few feet away. For the leader, though, there was no such luxury. He moved forward blindly, feeling along the cliff with his free arm, though his skin was so numb he could barely feel anything. As the path wound back again, he made a misstep and lost his footing. Just as a gust of wind blasted his back, he desperately grasped for the hold, but his frozen fingers couldn't get anything. With a terrified scream, he slipped off the cliff and fell into the icy black lake. Wow. That sucks. Like, I, I don't understand. Is this, like, the story? Is this the camp counselor? Is this his story? He's like, hey, you, you see this shit that's going on with us? Well, well, you could fucking die. Dicks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, and then he's like, kids, dicks. Would you rather walk through a forest full of dicks or a cave full of dicks? <laughs> that's, a, that's the story. <laughs> walk through a, a field full of dicks backwards? In my day, I had to walk two blocks uphill in dicks. <laughs> Backwards. <laughs> the rest of the party didn't see him fall, of course. All they saw was his glowing orb dropping away from the bluff and disappearing into darkness. There was no time to mourn. They continued on, but the storm was worsening. After another minute, one of the children, his body unable to withstand the cold, dropped away, his lantern glowing until the choppy water put it out. Another, having seen this, lost his balance and fell. The pattern went on until there were just five people left fumbling along in the darkness, following the light in front. As hard as they tried, the cliffs were unforgiving. The remaining men fell down to four, then three, then two, and then there was just one left. Who, legends say, cursed the earth as his legs... Oh, slipped. I thought he said skipped. He was gonna be like, <laughs> skipped across the ground! <laughs> and, pl <laughs> and plunged hundreds of feet down, his lantern the last one to be extinguished. Of the 20 members who tried to overcome the cliffs, I finished. Not one of them survived. They say that sometimes, when the conditions are right, you can see the orbs along the cliff, symbol of the lost travelers who will never find their homes. As the story ended, leaving the campers in eerie silence, I saw lights up ahead. A wave of relief poured over me. We picked up the pieces and found the ranger station bustling with activity. With a half dozen people running around, loading up trucks and shouting into radios, the wind was beginning to really pick up and heard thunder in the distance. Hey kids! A large burly man with a full beard or mustache ran up to us. Oh, that, was, that doesn't seem right, right voice for him. Given the truck, we don't have much time. <laughs> Laura, <laughs> Laura and I <laughs> let the kids the one in the pickup trucks. What's going on? I asked the man. Didn't you hear? Another gush. Another gust of wind. <laughs> Another Huge, gust of wind. <laughs> <laughs> Huge storm systems heading right for us. Already been tornadoes touched down. We're getting everyone out of here. Let's go. We all climbed into the truck's bed. I collapsed down, feeling like I'd just been punched in the gut. The ranger climbed to the front. We took off down a makeshift road. My head was spinning. It was impossible. How? Laura slid next to me, keeping her voice low. How did you know we had to get out of here? I said, because I needed to see that sweet poon. That sweet pussy girl. I looked over her. My face felt empty of any blood. I saw the lights. What? No. No. She gasped and caught herself. How many? I took a deep breath. Eight. She looked around at all the campers who were now lying against each other, asleep despite the bumpy road. That's all of us. My God. I nodded and leaned against her. Laura had heard the traveler's story before and she knew that I left out a key bit of information. The lights were real, but they were never random. If they were shining, bobbing back and forth, swinging a small arc, it's because they had a message, a warning. One light would shine for each person who was about to die. Whoa! That was whatever. It's okay. Yeah, well, okay. That was Terry. I know. I thought the. I thought the. I thought the length was all right. Oh, I know, just I... thought. I just thought the resolution was kind of like. Oh well, then they should have made the middle story smaller so that the punch of the story would actually mean yeah. something. There was so much filler in that, and they all died. Oh, guess what? They say if you see this many lights, that's how many people are gonna die. 
wait, there's eight of us. Eight lights. Boom. That's it. That's the story. That's all you had to fucking do. Yeah, and that that was like 20 seconds. Yeah, seriously. So that was Terry the Tick. Jack Reacher. Jack Reach Around. <laughs> so that was Jack Reach Around. <laughs> Terry the Tickler. Um, yeah, that was a, a campfire story that was found on uh, Creepypasta. The next one I'm going to read is one I remember finding when I was looking for sources. Uh, this is a Tumblr that goes by the name of Something Strange with two A's in Strange. A bunch of really cool stories. Um, I believe this person wrote them on tumblr originally but posted them to our no sleep for like 2015 contests and actually placed um i don't know if this one placed but one of them did okay. i just like this one the story is called my daughter died on her sixth birthday a man just handed me photos of her seventh I cannot describe to you how I feel right now. What I'm experiencing is so detached from the normal, I'm almost convinced I've finally gone insane. Almost. My wife, B, died during childbirth. She was gorgeous, funny, intelligent, but stubborn. A woman whose laugh was so loud eating in restaurants was a challenge, and whose stare was so intense it made my hands shake. I lost her as she gave birth to our daughter, Sam. Of course, I could have resented Sam for taking away what was once mine in a way no one else can be, for taking what was so truly and utterly pure, but I didn't. I knew B wouldn't have wanted any resentment. She wouldn't have wanted our only child to have a life ruined by hate. This isn't about grief. This isn't about the physical sucker punch of losing forever something you loved. This is about something far more sinister. My daughter was lively, always running and screaming, leaping up and down the climbing frame, causing havoc in her nursery classes. So for her sixth birthday, a trip with friends to the movies had left her so pent up with energy I could barely keep up with her as she dipped and dodged between people on the pavement. She'd occasionally turn back though through the sea of people and shout, daddy, come on, in a tone that was almost petulant. I couldn't help but love her. Daddy, come on. I tried to chase her, I really did. She was too busy looking at me when she dashed out into the road, and the bus didn't have time to stop. A sickening crunch and the world fell silent. I cradled her broken form in my arms, too numb to weep, too hurt to move. All I could feel was the warm blood gently seep into my clothes in the state of shock I was in. I could just think about how I was going to wash my jeans. It sounds horrid, I know, but a loss like that tears everything away from you and leaves you with only the bare thought process that makes us human. I love how, like, that, the fact that she died was within the first page of this five-page story. Like, instead of just, like, you know, instead of telling a story four halfway, pages. halfway into the story. And then be like, oh, here's the story, the scary yeah. part of it. Yeah. And you're like, oh, okay, cool. Fucking Canadians, man. This dude over here is like, I'm fucking their ass jeans, fucking ruined by this little bitch's blood. Fuck, dude. Fuck. Jeans. The next week was a blur. He really did, though. <laughs> the next week was a blur. I cannot place a single memory to a time in between friends and family extending their condolences and the howling sobs of mine that would break out at any moment. Because of my jeans. Yeah, seriously. I lost those fucking jeans. My jeans! <laughs> Bring them back! I need them! <laughs> I would do anything to have my jeans back. I would I would build a boat. A big enough boat for four people. We'd have a fun time on that boat. <laughs> Just me and my jeans <laughs> and my two shoes. <laughs> oh, a door slamming. The gentle hum of the fridge or voices laughing on the radio. It's a door. <laughs> yeah, that was the door <laughs> slamming. Yep, sounds just like a door slam. <laughs> what about the um the gentle hum of the fridge? <laughs> okay, I don't even know if I could pick that up. <laughs> or voices laughing on the radio. <laughs> oh, it's a lot like the fridge. <laughs> Sorry. Voices laughing on the radio. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what the, the voices on so the radio. It's a fucking Halloween. Oh my god. 
<laughs> oh, I attended her funeral dressed all in black, mainly because I didn't have my blue jeans. <laughs> By dressed, I don't mean merely clothes. I mean my blue jeans. <laughs> God don't damn mean it. merely clothes? Wait, wait. I don't mean merely clothes. My very essence was dark. Yeah, like, that's what all the goths say. Ooh. I couldn't feel... Or think, <laughs> and the day the crow is the best movie ever. That's more like it. <laughs> now we're offending the right population. <laughs> and the day continued as I went through the motions like a dying man treading water. Everyone wanted to tell me about Sam and how perfect she was, what an angel she was, as if I didn't know, as if I didn't realize what a gift my own daughter was. The man stood out from the rest as he walked up to me and handed me this large leather book. I assumed at the time he was a parent of one of Sam's friends handing me a collection of their photos together, or maybe I was too numb to even process his cold hands and how he never mentioned my daughter once. For a month I was lost, I drank and stayed in our now empty apartment alone watching old box sets, too numb now to even cry. Not even sex in the city can get me out of it now. Nor Seinfeld. But friends, friends I will. I, I am too numb to even cry. It was only when my sister arrived, when she held my hand and talked to me, and I became... Because only in the end... Doesn't even matter. Doesn't even matter. When she held my hand and talked to me that I began to come out of my shell, She'd sit and listen to the most inane things I said and gently coax me out of my depression. Not completely, but enough for me to begin to live what was almost a real life again. That was when I opened the book. I decided to remember Sam for all the joy she gave and was prepared to reflect on her life without feeling miserable. I opened to the first page. It was essentially a binder full of Polaroid photos of my daughter growing up. I furrowed my brow. They were taken from a distance blurred slightly, and I was in a few of them. I began to feel sick, but I hoped the following photos would provide some explanation. I came up with every excuse of how the man obtained these photos, desperate to view the moments of my daughter's life without a sense of trepidation. The photos grew closer and closer to my daughter's birthday. I could see the day I gave her a tiny bike after she turned five, and the skin knees that ensued. The book had so many more pages that I assumed the rest were empty. But there was a photo of her just before the movies on her sixth birthday. I could recognize the pink raincoat she insisted on wearing and my hands on her shoulders. There was no photo of the crash. Instead, her life continued inside this book. Her seventh birthday had a photo of me and her in the garden covered in paint with a huge canvas on the floor and an extremely messy painting. Her seventh birthday. Her seventh birthday. The reality of what I was seeing hit me and then I slammed the book shut. I sat there at the kitchen table, staring at the leather. This must be some sadistic photoshop. I hoped someone had taken the time to pull a horrid prank on me. I say I hoped because essentially I couldn't believe the other explanation, if there was one. Gritting my teeth, I decided I had nothing to lose and kept reading. I can't explain the emotions I felt whilst I read accurately, listening to the sound of the page turning. Tyranny. I can try, but nothing could prepare you for something like this. Her life continued, showing her losing her baby teeth her first day of senior school. My turning of the pages became more frenzied, and I began to notice something. The photographer was getting closer, closer to her. As she grew older, not in every photo, but a general trend, the photographer was getting closer and closer, more daring, perhaps. She was beautiful, stunning. As a teenager, she looked just like her mother, all curls and smiles. I grew older too, but the photos began to include me less and less. Her 16th birthday was strange. A group of her friends sitting outside, drinking from little plastic cups at a picnic. But there was someone in the background near the bushes of the park where this was taken. A dark figure stood. You wouldn't have noticed him if not for the small shadow he cast on the grass. I leant, I leant back for a moment and exhaled. This was too weird. I've been so caught up in watching my little girl grow up, I hadn't thought about how this would end. Moments like this are, are so utterly surreal that sometimes you remove yourself from them. I almost felt like I was watching myself read these, like this was a dream or a program on television. But I continued. I just kept going. 
Why Whatever. Not? The dark figure became more and more present in each photograph. I could almost make out his features. His presence was towering, and as I turned the page, I expected to see him disappear, but instead, as the photographs grew closer to her 18th, each birthday was marked by a caption underneath the Polaroid saying, Another year. She was no longer somewhere I recognized. Instead, the photos were of her in a dimly lit house, her face contorted by fear, striking all sorts of weird poses. Sometimes she would be dressed like an ancient queen, or she would be dressed like a maid scrubbing the floors. The figure was there even closer now. His legs or his arm would appear in each and every one, no matter how she was dressed. In every photo, her face had this desperately pained expression. It killed me. There were bruises on her face. She looked thin, ill even. I couldn't do it. This was sick, properly sick. My girl... I soldiered on. The last photo I looked at before I slammed the book shut and swore to never ever look at it again was over 18. The capture underneath read, at last, in sloppy writing. She was looking straight at the camera crying. She was on her knees, dressed in a black evening dress, with an apple in her mouth and her hands bound behind her back. Her makeup was ruined by her tears it was as if she was pleading me, begging me to help, but I couldn't. I closed the book and left the room, my whole body convulsing with sobs. I couldn't call the police, of course, she was dead. The thing that keeps me up at night isn't the content of what I saw. It's that there were so many pages left. And, you know, that's what tends to happen when... You go to so many parties with Paul Rubens. <laughs> <laughs> I see you, Donnie. <laughs> I'm coming for you, Donnie. <laughs> <laughs> Just shows her clean house. There's the chair flapping its arms around. <laughs> oh, that's so fucked up. Yeah, that was a good one. No, that was really good. I I enjoyed that though. This this the uh, the writer is a uh, definitely known for their craft. I I got a bunch of their stories. So um. So how are you feeling about uh about lots of pasta? Do you uh, are you a reader of the creepy pastas, Terry the Tickler? Yeah, I uh, I take a fork and a spoon and I twirl it up and I eat my pasta. You'd you'd be surprised to know that, that you know this this is the first I've heard someone respond to the, the title of the show with with that original line of thought. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, pasta's great. <laughs> A little bit of s- meatballs, right? Some spagoto <laughs> sauce on there. Spagoto. I love me that um rotino, rotini, uh, rosti- tostinis. Toast- yeah, toast- yeah, chef. Uh, Pizza rolls. Okay, all right. So at one point, uh, our one friend he was getting a a next gen s- system. <laughs> and he's like, oh, what should my name be? And I'm like. Yo, I got the best name for you. Chef Boyar, these nuts. I'm done. I'm <laughs> out. You. Mic drop. Why wasn't that your name? I, I, I It's too long. Yeah, you're right. Just like, <laughs> these nuts. Oh. All right, so you're going to read the next story. Oodles and noodles. Creepy pasta. All right, so here we go. We're about to read Robert the Doll. I'm going to read it in a Mickey Mouse voice for like, one sentence. In the late 1800s, Bob Asado and his family moved into the mansion at the corner of Eaton and Sabaton Street in Key West, Florida, now known as the Artist House. The autos were known to be stern with their servants, sometimes even mistreating them. It was the treatment of one such Haitian servant that provides a twist in this story. This woman was hired to take care of their son, Robert. One day, Mrs. Otto supposedly witnessed her practicing black magic in the backyard and fired her. Before she left, the woman gave Robert a lifelike doll which stood three feet tall, had buttons for eyes, human hair, ew, believed to be Robert's, and was filled with straw. It's just creepy. Dolls that resembled, ch- resembled children were not unheard of during this time, but this one proved to be special. Robert named the doll after himself and often dressed in his clothes. Robert the doll became his trustworthy companion. He took it with him on shopping trips into town. The doll had a seat at dinner. <laughs> at dinner, dinner table. Where Robert would sneak in bites of food when the parents weren't looking. That's a dirty doll. Robert would even be tucked in the bed with the boy at night. Soon, the innocent relation took on a strange nature. 
Soon after, Robert chose to be referred to by his middle name, Jean. After being scolded by his mother, he told her that Robert was the doll's name, not his. Jean was often heard in his toy room, having conversations with Robert. Jean would say something in his childish manner, and responses could be heard in a much lower voice. Hey. Hey, Robert, how are you feeling today? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> how you doing, Jean? I'm just hanging out with you. My name's Robert. <laughs> I didn't know he lost all of his teeth. Yeah, I, don't, I don't have any teeth on the fucking doll. <laughs> Jean would become very agitated, worrying the servants and his mother. She would, on occasion, burst in to find her son cowering in a corner while Robert sat perched in a chair or on the bed glaring at him. This was only the beginning. Household objects were, would soon be found thrown across the room. Jean's toys turned up mutilated and giggling could be heard. Wherever these unusual acts took place, Jean was always, always said, Robert did it. The boy took the punishment, but always insisted the blame was Robert's. As the mischief grew, more and more servants took their leave as new ones were hired. The Otto's relatives felt it was time to do something. With the recommendations of a great aunt, Jean's parents removed Robert from his care, placed him in a box in the attic. This is where he resided for many years. After the death of his father, Jean was willed his boyhood home. He decided to live in a Victorian mansion with his new wife. Jean had become an artist, and felt the house was spacious and would provide a place for him to paint. He went to the attic and dusted off his childhood toy. He became attached to the doll despite his wife's displeasure. It's fucking creepy. Yeah, seriously. He still goes by Jean, too. Jean would take. Isn't her name Robert? <laughs> Jean would take the doll along with them everywhere they went. He even sat in his favorite little chair while Jean and his wife slept nearby. The turret room. That's where I keep all my turrets. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> became Robert's domain after Miss, Mrs. Otto moved them back to the attic. Their marriage slowly became sour <laughs> until Mrs. Otto supposedly went insane and died of unknown reasons. And Jean it, it followed didn't soon. Didn't have anything to do with Robert. Hi, my name's Robert. Jean followed soon behind. <laughs> Robert supposedly. Oh, oh, whoa. Robert supposedly attacked people, sometimes locking them in the attic. I thought I said kicking them in the shins. Locking them in the attic. <laughs> people who passed by claimed to hear evil laughter coming from the turret room. <laughs> it wasn't gunfire. <laughs> it wasn't the gunfire. <laughs> For some reason, Robert remained in the empty house by himself until a new family purchased the mansion and restored it. The doll was once again moved to the attic. This pleased it as much as the last time. The doll was often found throughout the house. On one certain night, Robert was found at the foot of the owner's bed giggling with a kitchen knife in hand. This was enough to send them fleeing from the home. Robert was later moved to the East Martello Museum in Key West, where he sits perched in a glass box. Despite his new living quarters, the doll is believed to not have given up his menacing ways. Visitors and employees claim they have seen the doll move. His smile has been known to turn into a scowl. One employee cleaned Robert, turned off all the lights, and left for the night. The next day, he returned to find lights turned on, Robert sitting in a different position than the night before, and a fresh layer of dust on his shoes. Some say he'll even curse you. If you want to take a picture of him, you must ask politely. He'll tilt his head in permission. However, if he doesn't, and you take the picture anyways, a curse will befall upon you and anyone who accompany you to the museum. The same will happen if you make fun of him. To this day, Robert remains at the East Martello Museum in his sailor suit, clutching his stuff line, continuing his menacing ways. Yeah, uh, they definitely didn't take a note out of the Hardings notebook with Annabelle, which is an actual story. What? What's Annabelle? Annabelle? You know the, um, the people from The Conjuring? Huh? They were real. They did real... Real paranormal investigations in the fifties and sixties. That. Yeah, that's why the movie. that's why yeah that's why both of the Conjuring movies are so great. And Annabelle is a spinoff. All right, so we're gonna do some we're gonna do some quicker, uh, shorter stories now to finish off the episode. This one is called Counting. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter woke me up around eleven fifty last night. My wife and I had picked her up from her friend Sally's birthday party, brought her home, and put her to bed. My wife went into the bedroom to read while I fell asleep watching the Braves game. Daddy, she whispered. Oh, sorry. Daddy, she whispered, tugging my shirt sleeve. Guess how old I'm going to be next month. I don't know, beauty, I said as I slipped on my glasses. How old? She smiled and held up four fingers. 
It is 7.30 now. My wife and I have been up with her for almost eight hours. She still refuses to tell us where she got them. Oh. I found four fingies, Daddy. So that was, <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm getting at, right? She just found four fingies. Here, look at me. I'm going to be this old next month. Four fingies. Guess where I found them? He said, I, uh, the dog. <laughs> the dog ate them. Are we Adam Sandler now? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, so one time, one time I was, uh, I was on a boat, and, uh, with my friends, and we were just, uh, we were, we were, you know, acting, acting the fool, and, and the captain came out, and the, and the captain, he had a, he had a hook for a hand, and he was just yelling, GET TO THE BACK OF THE BOAT! <laughs> I found you a one page. Oh, hell yeah. Insanity. It has been said. Okay, I'll read a little louder. It has been said. of insanity. <laughs> it has been said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. I understand the sentiment behind the saying, but it's wrong. I earned a building on a bet. I was strapped for cash and didn't buy into the old legends of the hotel to begin with. So 50 bucks was more than enough to get me to do it. It was simple. Just reach the top floor, the 45th floor, shine my flashlight from a window. Wow, this guy really sells himself cheap. The hotel was old and broken down, including the elevator, so that meant hiking up the stairs really sells himself cheap. Fuck that. So up the stairs I went. As I reached each platform, I noted the old brass plaques displaying the floor numbers 15, 16, 17, 18. Felt a little tired as I crept higher, but so far, no ghosts, no cannibals, no demons, piece of cake. I can't tell you how happy I was as I entered the last stretch of numbers. I joyfully counted them aloud at each platform. 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 44. I stopped and looked back down the stairs. I must have miscounted, so I continued up 44. One more flight, 44. And then down 10 flights, 44. 15 flights, 44. So it's been for as long as I can remember. So really, insanity isn't doing something repeatedly, inspecting different results. It's knowing that the results will never change, that each door leads to the same staircase, to the same number. It's realizing that you no longer fall asleep. It's not... Knowing whether you've been running for days or weeks or years, it's when the sobbing slowly turns into laughter. Huh. Was, he was climbing those steps pretty fast. You were like 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 44. Like, like he was, he was sprinting. He should ask for like a thousand dollars at that point. Forty five. Because at least then he could cry in his forty fourth floor. Forty five floors. Now that is insanity. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You do that six oh, month. You do that six months long, and oh, yet, yeah, you'll be in good shape. Oh. Oh! Oh! This is World War Cannibal. After World War One, times in Moscow were hard. Everyone seemed to be starving, and food was extremely rare. A young woman is in a crowd and sees an old, blind man hobbling his way through. Woman guides him and begin talking. Old man asks favor of woman to deliver letter. Since the address is next door, she agrees. She walks away, she feels a sense of unease, and turns around. Old man was running away. So terrified woman ran to police. After raiding address on letter, they found a butcher selling human flesh. Letter read, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> this is the last one. I'm sending you. Reading that accent, like, made it less, like, spooky. But that was pretty good. I'll give it the that. The time in Moscow is, uh, you eat the people. You eat, you eat people. Or people eat you. <laughs> oh, people <laughs> eat you. Oh, shit. You want to read this one? Yeah, sure. The voice. The voice. It's that. Sh it's a Christina Aguilera show. She's not on it anymore. I don't fucking care. And call it that. <laughs> it has that dude from Maroon Five, uh, Adam West. Adam West. Yeah. Come on, I'll teach you how to sing. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Robin. Let's go. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> a young girl is playing in her bedroom when she hears her mother call to her. Oh, this one. Yeah, I love this one. Here's okay. So this one. Let me redo this one. Let's start from the top here. 
A young girl is playing in her bedroom when she hears her mother call her from the kitchen. So she runs downstairs. Now she's run through the hallway, the door to the cupboard, under the stairs opens. A hand reaches out and pulls her in. It's her mother. The woman whispers to her child, Don't go in the kitchen, I heard it too. <laughs> Can you just get, what was that, Bob? Can you say one more time? Don't go in the kitchen, I heard it too. What was, what was that? Don't go in the kitchen, I heard it too. Yeah. Well, that was like yeah, I got it that time. Element. That's the first like our no sleep story I ever read. That's you know that's cool. That's mighty convenient. All right, it was just quick. I'm gonna read this one from Reddit No Sleep. It's called Outside. I was watching the newscast of a murder on the loose. They knew who it was. They just couldn't catch him. They even gave his description. I looked out my glass door and see a man in my backyard standing in the snow. It matches his description. I look down just for a moment to get my phone and look back up and see he's closer now and and he's smiling. I finally notice there's no footprints in the snow. It's his reflection. Behind him is Nicolas Cage looking oh. for the Declaration of Independence. Oh! oh. Fuck! Hey kid, kid, I need your help. Oh, I <laughs> Smile. Go, I gotta go fast. I gotta, I gotta, we're gonna break out the deck. <laughs> We're going to break out the Declaration of Independence. We're going to break it out of jail. <laughs> You're coming with me. The guy's like, I like killing people. <laughs> I had a feeling that's the fucking like, way it was going to take to at the end. Yeah, have you not read that one before? No. That's a good one. Oh, this one. Oddly enough, I was thinking of this one last night. Like I'm like, one. man, we should do uh, short stories and read them in goofy voices. Oddly enough, this is the one I thought of reading in a goofy voice. I'm, wait I'm waiting. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Look to your left. No one is there. Look to your right. No one is there. Look behind you. No one is there. Look below you at your feet. No one is there. Now repeat. Just to make sure. Don't look above you. She doesn't like being seen. Coming to a theater near you. Starring Scarlett Johansson as she who doesn't want to be seen. And starring Seth Rogen as the big guy looking around. Uh, <laughs> where's my weed? Where's my weed? This is a movie by Spud a Potato. <laughs> this one's called The Camera. Reddit No Sleep. I love to go hiking. I go every chance I get. I recently acquired a new camera and was excited to take some shots of some trails here around Oregon. I usually go with a couple of buddies, but everyone bailed at the last minute, so I decided to go by myself. I'm not there now. I've, I've done long trails by myself before, and I always feel comfortable doing so, naked. But this particular trail... The forest made me feel really uneasy. The trees seemed to bend. The air felt stale. And I never heard a single bird. Chirp! <laughs> I was so creeped out that I never took a single photo while on the trail. But I love hiking. <laughs> I wanted to turn around, but by the time I wanted to do so, the sun was about to set, damn it. So I made camp and decided I would leave first light. I made it home and a week went by. I took some pictures around the house and loaded them up on my computer and I was clicking through the photos when my heart stopped. Like literally, like I fucking, like I literally, I literally fucking died, man. I was gonna say, he's dead. Literally. I stumbled onto a picture. Literally, I stepped on it. It was a picture of me on the hiking trip last week, fast asleep in my tent, alone in my sleeping bag. Literally. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> forever alone. Oh my god, so this this one this one I saved for another friend, but uh but Terry the Tickler said he, he didn't know this one and this is one of my favorites. Last podcast on the left repeats this like every creepypasta episode and it's one of the funniest fucking things I've ever heard. I wanna see your attempt at this. Alright, here we go. So you're sitting with your honey and you're making out when the phone rings, you answer it in, in the voice is, what are you doing with my daughter? You tell your girl and she say, my daddy's dead. The who's phone? 
was both. This is the mom, you know, right? Like, why did yeah, we no, immediately it's... establish that it was the dad? My dad is deep. My dad is dead. <laughs> My dad is deep. It's like she she comes on thick, you know? Like, they're just making out, and she's like, my dad's dead. Like, baggage. What are you doing with my daughter? <laughs> so, uh, my, my, like, my reason for loving this story is, like, one day I'm going to write a really intricate, like, creepypasta, and it's going to end with a situation where the protagonist is making out with his honey on a couch, and the phone's going to ring, and she's going to hand it. And then she's going to say, my dad is dead. And it's going to say, then who was phone? But it's going to be a 20 page long story. And you're going to work all the way up to this moment. And that's what happens. And I can't, and I can't wait to finish that story. Then who was phone? Then who was phone? We're, we're, I think we're both <laughs> off. <laughs> And now I'm doing Law and Order SVU now. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh, it's got the best fucking theme. Terry the Tickler. Man. So that's going to be the end of this, uh, this lots of pasta. Oh, come on. I'm all. Yep. Unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. On. Unfortunately, we're going to have to end with. <laughs> With who was phone? I feel like it's a perfect topper Damn. to the end of this episode. Yeah, last one. <laughs> how, do, how, how did you feel about this lots of pasta expedition? <laughs> Appropriate. That was fun. <laughs> Real fun. That was a fun time. It was pretty fun being here. Doing some to read some stories and stuff. You had a fun time. I had a fun time. It did you? Did you really have a fun time? <laughs> you just got me. It's gonna have to put that, put that, put that thing done. Here, I'm gonna end it on the scary story of them all. One day, open up the fridge, no milk. Two to the one, from one to the three. I like the pussy and I like the tree. Smoke so much weed, she wouldn't believe. And I get more ass than a toilet seat. Three to the one, from one to the three. I met a bad bitch last night in the deep. Drop.